welcome to the inaugural episode of I Am Nano, where we introduce you to the world of nanoscience and nanotechnology. I am your host, Irfani. And I am your other host, Monica. And today, we are going to introduce ourselves and why we love nano. Putting the I in I am nano, let's hear about Irfani's story first. So Irfani, please tell us a little bit about yourself. I spent my early years in Indonesia as a little girl and then moved to Malaysia and spent a few years in Japan for my middle and high school years. When I decided where I wanted to go for college, I wanted to go somewhere that would allow me to pursue a career in the medical field. While weighing out all the factors, I ended up deciding to go to, to do an undergraduate degree in physiology, which is a field of scientific study of the functions and activities of living matter. Wow, that's amazing. So how did you end up doing nanotechnology for graduate school then? At some point during my undergraduate years, I realized that going to medical school wasn't something that I was interested in anymore. But after working in an immunology infectious agents lab and cell biology lab, I knew that I still wanted to be in the healthcare field. So after talking to different professors and people, I made the realization that I wanted to contribute in the technology aspect of healthcare. Within the realm of healthcare technology, I was more interested in the sensing aspect because if we can diagnose or detect signs of the diseases earlier, we can help the patient to be healthier sooner. So this is where I started getting really interested in using nanomaterials, nanotechnology to develop biosensors. Oh, that sounds so interesting. Now, what exactly is a biosensor? So biosensors are devices that can detect the concentrations of biological components from a biological sample. Oh, so are biosensors something relatively new or have they been around for a while? They are relatively new. Uh, the first one was developed by Leland C. Clark in 1956 for the detection of oxygen. And the sensor, the sensor is called the Clark electrode. His discovery is so important that it bears his name. Wow, amazing. But what exactly is this Clark electrode then? So it's a tube that contains an electrode, conductive material, and protected by a porous material that electrically detects the concentration of oxygen in blood. Now, this allows surgeons to monitor the oxygen levels of patients during cardiopulmonary bypass surgeries. Back then, this was a huge feat of technology. And from here, he further developed his first glucose sensor prototype by placing glucose enzymes on electrodes. And since then, there are many different types of biosensors that detect these biological components through various techniques. That's amazing. It's such a simple chemical setup, but he was able to develop it into this device that facilitates life-saving surgeries. And to think now, biosensors are all around us, especially those glucose strips for diabetic patients. Professor Clark has significantly changed all our lives. Yeah. So that was back in the 1950s and approximately 70 years have passed. Significant improvements must have been made since then. So how has nanotechnology contributed to the development of these biosensors? Let's start with that. What exactly is nanotechnology, Rafami? Nanotechnology is essentially the study of materials at the nanoscale. To put into perspective, these materials are a billion times smaller than a meter stick. They're very small, but they're very powerful materials. This then allows the miniaturization of sensor themselves and doesn't require a large volume of sample. This is great news to me because, you know, whenever I go get blood tests, the nurses draw out a few milliliters of my blood. And so with nanotechnology-based sensors, we only need a few microliters, so a few drops of blood. Another amazing thing about these nanomaterials is their high surface area to volume ratio which helps to make the biosensors more sensitive and accurate. So is it similar to the Stark medical scanner that Iron Man used in the second movie to measure his <laughs> palladium levels, to measure indeed his blood toxicity? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, some are already in the market, such as the pregnancy tests that use gold nanoparticles. That is so cool. Movie magic certainly comes to life nowadays. 
Mm-hmm. So what kind of research do you do now for your PhD? So I am currently working on developing a transdermal carbon nanotube biohybrid biosensor for the real-time monitoring of lactate levels. But it can also be translated to other biomolecule targets, such as glucose. Wow, that was quite a mouthful. Amazing. Mm-hmm. So carbon nanotubes are the nanomaterials that you use, right? What exactly are they? Mm-hmm. Good question. To think of them like a hollow tube made of carbon atoms, but the cab- carbon atoms are arranged like a honeycomb structure that can conduct electricity and is a billion times smaller. Oh, wow. So that means they're invisible to the naked eye and can only be visualized using special microscopes, right? Yeah, they're that small. So what do you do with these carbon nanotubes then? I treat them with various molecules, including chains of polymers and proteins, to make them more stable, sensitive, and accurate. And as I mentioned before, nanomaterials have a high surface area. So with these carbon nanotubes, I can load more enzymes that increases the signal when it is in contact with the biological component or biomarker. So that must mean that we can get real-time measurements of various biomarkers of these molecules that are in our bloodstream? Yeah. For sure. And I am working on making the sensor to be a transdermal sensor, meaning that it has microneedles. These are small needles that won't hurt you as much as catheters, um, and they will extract a small amount of blood from your skin continuously. Wow, that's super cool. And it must be like those Apple watches then, but this time you detect biomarkers in your blood. Yes, exactly. And imagine that you're able to monitor how the levels fluctuate over time, and then you'll be able to know if you're healthy or if you need to make changes in your lifestyle. Wow, that's the future right there, folks. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing that. I can't wait to talk more about it and hear about the progress on your project. Now, for a little bit more of a fun question, if you could go back in time and meet anyone, who would it be and why? Mm, Okay, this is hard because there are so many wonderful, amazing scientists that I would love to meet. But I definitely would love to meet Marie Curie. Oh, yes, Marie Curie. She's amazing. Yeah. So she was the first woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize for her work in radiation, along with her husband, Pierre Curie, and Professor Henri Bacara. I'm probably butchering the name, but she is also the only woman to ever see the Nobel Prize twice. She's such an accomplished scientist. And to know that she did it during a time when women in science is not as common as today is astounding. Her husband, Pierre, was an advocate for women in science, and he made sure that she was included in the first Nobel Prize. Dr. Curie is amazing, but there are also other amazing scientists that we will get to know later, right? Now, Monica, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm not quite as internationally educated in terms of my schooling as you are. I am from Southern Ontario. Originally, I'm part of the Franco-Ontario community here. And then once I got to university, it was all in English. So Mm -hmm. I can comment on making the switch is a little bit challenging in terms of going from full-time French education to a full-time English education. It's tricky, but it is doable. Mm -hmm. My undergraduate education was in nanoscience. That was the name of my degree. During undergrad, I worked in a nutrition lab, an analytical vaccine chemistry lab, a food science lab, and then an electrochemistry lab. But it wasn't until my final year where I actually ended up taking an organic chemistry course. So basically reactions with only carbon. I loved the first one. So organic chemistry one, orgo one, ended up taking the courses of organic chemistry one through four. And that ended up landing me in a position in a lab doing a master's degree in organic chemistry, specializing in sulfur synthesis. So Mm. basically making white powders that smelled really bad. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, not all of them, but there is that conception that, you know, sulfur, Mm -hmm. smelly Mm -hmm. compounds. Mm -hmm. So that was my master's degree. And then for my PhD, I found that I really like the nano stuff, but I still like the organic stuff. So then I ended up combining the two, entering the field of organic materials, where I made small tweezers that can grab on to those carbon nanotubes that you were discussing from before 
and trying to align them. That's quite a unique combination of science. I mean, organic chemistry and nanotechnology is not very common, is it? Can you tell us a little bit more? So basically, organic chem is commonly known for making drug molecules. A lot of people in organic chemistry you know, we can design drug molecules and drug synthesis and basically pharmaceutical applications. Right, so instead, right. in this organic material synthesis field, it's designing molecules based on carbon, but with the applications of not putting them into pharmacy and mm -hmm. drug molecules, but putting them towards electronic devices such as solar cells or transistors. Oh, cool. What's a transistor? So transistors are basically switches. So kind of like you have your light switch, you can turn between the on and off, lights on and lights off. Mm -hmm. Well, with transistors, it's electrically, we're turning our cell phones on and off and they work together to, you know, tur turn our devices on and all those different types of electronic components. Oh, so basically these transistors are everywhere in our electronic devices, right? Yes, exactly. Cell phones, computers, and anything where you're incorporating that kind of smart technology. Mm -hmm. I see. And yeah, so then we're getting smaller and smaller in terms of the number of transistors we can fit into our devices. So what I mean by that is that there has been a postulation that the physical limits of how many transistors per chip we can fit, that tends to double every two years. We have a finite surface area, but the number of transistors we want to maximize because then we can switch our devices on and off faster. That was postulated by Dr. Gordon Moore in 1954. So basically, every two years, the number of transistors in our device seems to double. Mm -hmm. But we're actually reaching the limits of that, of how many transistors we can fit in our devices. So as you can tell, we're, we're in 2020, that's going to start to become a problem. Well, right. when's the new iPhone going to come out and is it going to be better? Right. We are making things smaller. We need to have smaller transistors as well, right? Exactly. So now as of 2020, we have five nanometer transistors. So that's Apple's A14 bionic mm. transistor component. So those are in mm -hmm. the very new iPhone 12s. That's why mm -hmm. they're so expensive. It's very <laughs> difficult to fabricate wow. these small types of transistors. Now I understand. Okay, yeah. why they're so expensive. Well, that kind of justifies the price. You can think uh -huh. of it that way. Mm -hmm. We also have fin fats. So think of it as a shark fin transistor. That's where the fin part comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little fin kind of sticking out of your device. But essentially, we are reaching the limits of our current transistors. Those are made out of silicon. So mm -hmm. essentially, my line of work is to replace the silicon with a different type of mm -hmm. nanomaterial, namely the carbon nanotubes to increase scalability and have better transport, being able to turn our device on and off faster and so that there's increase in communication in our devices and that they're overall better. Oh, wow. So these materials are essentially semiconductors, right? Yes, you are correct. They are semiconductors. But the, this is actually a very interesting discussion. Carbon nanotubes can be either semiconducting or metallic. Mm -hmm. So for transporting electricity, usually we have metals, which right. they conduct electricity, gold, silver, copper. And that's the reason you can, you have to remove your jewelry when you're doing electrical work, right? You don't want to be at risk right. of yeah. being electrocuted because <laughs> yeah, those metals good. conduct, right? right. Mm -hmm. Then there's also insulators. So the exact opposite of the metals, they don't conduct anything. Mm -hmm. Trap the electrons, do not let them flow, like rubber, plastic, or wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. Also diamond, it's made out of carbon under pressure, you know, and... Carbon is everywhere, such as coal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Element number six, our favorite, of course. It's everywhere. Diamond is a bunch of single bonds of carbon, and it's an insulator. But we're mm -hmm. talking about carbon nanotubes, also right. made out of carbon. But they can be either metallic or semiconducting. And that's because of their structure. So the double bonds in there can either make them conducting, moving the electrons really fast, mm -hmm. or depending on the conditions, move the electrons when only the conditions are right, similar to silicon, which is mm -hmm. what most of our transistors are made up of. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I want only the semiconducting carbon right. nanotubes 
to replace these silicon-based transistors, and that can be very difficult. So that's what you were doing for your entire PhD project, right? Yes. This is this is a promising, very promising project. So we'll get even more powerful computers than when we have now. Well, that's the idea. Great observation. Oh wow, that's that's really amazing. Because I mean. I think we have powerful computers all around us already, but if we can have a computer on the tips of our hands, as strong as the ones we have on desktop, that will be amazing. Wow, mm -hmm. thank you yes. so much for sharing this. I'll be yeah, looking forward be to what's, what the development is coming for the next few years. Yes, would be okay. So same question. If you could go back in time, who would you meet and why? So you picked definitely one of the most influential people in the past 100 years, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mary Curie, amazing scientist, completely yes. agree with you, would love mm -hmm. to hear. But I think if I were to go back, I would go to around maybe year 200, be oh, wow. 300, so <laughs> third century, ago. yeah, a long time, time ago, ago, way back in the day to Alexandria, where it says that Cleopatra the alchemist was rumored to have work. That's not to be confused with Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, okay? There's mm. about a 200 years difference between oh. the two. Okay, I didn't know so, that. So this Cleopatra, the alchemist, it's an alias, and mm -hmm. it could be one lady or it could be a group of ladies. And so I'd be very interested in finding and out and learning about them or her. Mm -hmm. And like with many alchemists, she will work towards creating the Philosopher's Stone. So trying to turn common metals into gold oh. and find the elixir of life. Yeah, it's not wow. just something out of Harry Potter. Their <laughs> alchemy was based on trying to discover this. Wow. Yes. And she was one of four female alchemists that were actually noted to be able to create the Philosopher's Stone. This Cleopatra is also considered, interestingly, the inventor of a specific distillation system. So distillation being a way to purify liquids. Mm -hmm. And she discovered what is known as the Alembic. So this two-prone distillation apparatus. And actually, it's interesting that it's still used today for purifying cognac. So I could learn a lot from Cleopatra the Alchemist, and I would love to meet her. Oh, wow. That's amazing. This system that's been around for almost two millennia is still being used in laboratories today. It's a huge impact for her to have. Well, it seems like we both love CNTs. And now, you know what? Get out, Diamond. CNTs are a girl's best friend now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very cool to see how we both had two different paths and found our way to using nanotechnology in different ways. Yes. I agree. I think this speaks to the broad and diverse applications of nanotech and the impact it can have. In fact, even in the Angry Birds 2 movie that I was watching the other day, nanoscience is mentioned as a means of getting the lava inside the ice balls <laughs> to attack the neighboring bird island. What? Yes. Okay. So it's becoming more and more mainstream. But so it's important to also understand what's reality and what is still science fiction. That's very true. But pretty much now technology can help improve many aspects of our lives, the good, the bad, and as there are certain toxicity effects, we don't have full understanding of them yet. Yes, there's still things we don't understand. And as you mentioned, nanotoxicology of the mm -hmm. coming field. And over the course of this series, we will delve into clarifying terms, terminologies, and misconceptions. For sure. All right, that's all the nano for today. Take care. And stay curious. <laughs>